and we're really fortunate to have master of science communicator Sarah Poyer, who brings 20 years of experience and a master's in science communication from University of Edinburgh, oh, science communication, um, mm -hmm. to share so many proven insights. So it's ironic that we're here today in COVID times. I mean, we're just starting to reopen, but uh, NIM events will stay virtual, I think probably until uh, till January timeframe. We'll see kind of what happens, but um, I feel like we've all adapt very well online and I think it's, it's important to be safe. But Sarah and I had planned this talk in January, long before Fauci became a household name. And uh, as with all campaigns, but particularly when I would say a pandemic is spreading, strategic communication is really crucial. And I've noticed that there are some ways that I would have handled some of the science communications in the pandemic era a little bit differently. Um, so we're gonna hop into some questions for Sarah and please be sure to add yours to the chat. So Sarah, let's, let's just jump in and give everybody a sense of science communication and how that is different than traditional communication, whether that's marketing, PR, journalism, you know, the whole, the whole gamut, uh, if you wanna just give us some framework or context. Sure, so science communication is about um, communicating science with the public, you know, increasing awareness or understanding or engaging them more deeply around issues in science and technology that impact their lives, um, or, you know, engaging communities and things like, climate change or applications of nanotechnology. And it can take many forms from exhibits at science centers to books, uh, magazine articles, um, art even is getting in the game to public dialogue and science cafe. So there's all these different ways that science communication can occur. occur. So it's specifically focused on science. Nice. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background. You were a scientist and mm -hmm. now your focus is science communications. Right, um, so I was working in space sciences, working in research, and I was working on a couple of different projects, but I just couldn't decide. I felt, you know, I was like, they were all so interesting. And at the same time, um, I was working for the university, uh, coordinating public lecture series, giving tours at the university's telescope, um, and developing websites. So I had had a taste of communicating science and working with the public, and I really, really enjoyed that. So a job came up at the Ontario Science Center, which is you know, like the Boston Museum of Science um, for the staff space scientists and I hopped on it and ended up working there and I loved it. Um, ended up, you know, doing things like producing planetarium shows and our live demonstrations to developing traveling exhibitions, um, working on our podcasts and YouTube channels and just, you know, anything you can imagine. And so it's kind of like my dream job and um, a bit like being a kid in a candy store, but over the years, um, I felt more and more interested in the science the sci behind science communication. So, you know, what motivates people to learn? How do people understand? Um, how do they process information? And I really, really wanted to understand that deeper because I thought it could really help me be more strategic in these this work that I was producing. And I, you know, you put all this time and effort into it, and you want to be you want to be sure that what you're creating is going to be effective. So um, a few years ago, I decided to go back to school and do my master's in science communication at the University of Edinburgh. And um, it was awesome. We really, you know, drilled down on the theory behind human cognition, um, looked at some of the greatest case studies from around the world, not just in North America, around you know organizations that are engaging the public in science on you know really big issues that are concerning us and also looked at tools and strategies uh, that have been developed in the field and basically while it was halfway through grad school i launched my consulting company and now i'm taking all that stuff and all that background experience and helping others um, communicate their science better and engage the public a little bit better hopefully anyways 
Yeah, and you have some really fun projects under your belt already. Uh, I know that you had, you mentioned you had media experience when you were working for the Science Center. Mm -hmm. How have you expanded and grown that? Because as we know, multimedia is really a big focus today. Yeah, um, you know, I was really fortunate at the Science Center. We were very experimental very early on with um, new media. So, you know, early 2000s, we had a YouTube channel, we were doing podcasting. And so I had a lot of opportunity to dabble in those areas. At the same time, when I started my career in science communication, there were very few female science communicators. And so I worked really hard to establish a position as a commentator on science in local and national media in Canada. Um, I even had a couple of my own shows uh, for TVO. And so that was really good because there was, again, a lot of working in different formats and different mediums and just learning on the fly how to communicate science better and, you know, in different formats, what are the types of things that work and how to really break down messages and simplify them so that they're accessible and engaging for your audience. Nice. And what, I know that you have um, TV shows behind you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, I don't know. I uh, oh yeah. Okay. So um, when I grew up, this is great. I, I think this is a good example to start with because um, when I grew up, was a direct result of some of the strategies I was learning about in school. And um, we were learning, uh, there was a paper that I read that talked about how kids who don't have, any, have low science capital in their, in, their, in their homes, basically who don't have any direct interaction with people who are scientists or work in fields that use science, if, if they don't identify with science by the age of 10, there's very little, um, there's very little chance that they're going to study any science beyond high school, which I thought was really amazing because typically a lot of our STEM career, science, technology, engineering, and math, our STEM career awareness campaigns are all targeted at high school students. But here the research was showing us that, you know, if kids, if kids don't identify with STEM by the age of 10, they're basically going to be missing out on all of these opportunities. And as you know, you know, science and technology basically use it for anything you need. These are, there are fundamental tools and skills that you need, whether you're a pool technician or a solar array installer, there's science and technology um, principles in there that you need in order to be able to do your job effectively and advance in your career. So um, with that, I used some of the strategies that we were learning about at, at, in school. One of them was called a needs analysis to really find out what was the best, um, sort of the best uh, approach to address this problem for this audience and came up with a pitch for a TV show that ended up getting greenlit. And so while I was finishing my master's, I was also juggling co-producing this show, um, which was really fun and delightful. And it was about this 10-year-old girl, Michaela, who traveled around visiting all of these different professions from a software engineer at Google to a, um, let me see, to a, a food science technician, to a cosmetologist, and learning how they use science and technology in their jobs. And one of the really neat things that we did with this show that was unique is every single, not only did every single profession align with the school curriculum to show kids how school science is directly transferable to the real world, it also was presented through the lens of their values and interests. Because research shows that when young people think about what they want to be when they grow up, they think about it in terms of what they value. So I value helping people. So what careers allow you to help people um, that also use the science and technology that you're learning about in school? So um, that was the approach. And again, that tool of this needs analysis of doing this work up front to really look at your audience and what they need and start from that place to think about what sort of um, approach or vehicle you might want to use to address it was really, really helpful because it not only really um, clearly 
advocated for the, the use of a television show, but it also gave us terrific language and research that supported funding applications. Um, and th this whole thing was your idea then, and then, so is your pitch your idea? That's yes. awesome. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks. I just put, I just put, uh, put the link into the chat. I think I have the right oh, one. Oh, cool. TVO, right? TVO Kids? Yep. Yes, I recognize Michaela. Good. Yeah. Nice. Well, and I think, and also you're working uh, with games, right? Like multimedia online games? Yes. Yeah. So again, and what's interesting and um, sort of arrived at this place is a lot of the same thinking behind developing a good hands-on interactive exhibit can be translated to a digital space. And in fact, I think that, you know, coming from a hands-on museum world, I have advantages that people who just come from the gaming side of things because I've worked in a physical space where we've developed all these physical experiences that might you could might be novel if you translated them to a digital space. And so, um, you know, again, I think that some of the principles around how you engage people in content apply regardless of the medium, regardless of whether you're in a a physical space or a digital space, the same fundamental principles apply. And a lot of times it's just about being creative and meeting people where they, they are and, um, you know, engaging them in, in new and interesting ways. And I think that that's something, you know, that's one of the things that I find most interesting about my work is trying to come up with new ways of getting people to engage in, in content and new types of experiences for them. Nice. Awesome. All right. And then let's talk about something a little bit closer to home. I know that you, uh, speaking of pivoting, had to pivot quite a bit for Equinic Island Earth Week, which was something that you had been working on for months and months, and then um, ended up going virtual. Yes. Yes. Boy, oh boy. April was <laughs> a cr crazy month for everybody, as I'm, as I'm sure. Um, so Equinic Island Earth Week was an idea for a week-long celebration of the environment and sustainable initiatives across Aquidneck Island. And this was in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And so we wanted to bring organizations from across the, you know, across the island together who are working on these issues to create this week-long focused event. Um, and so, uh, you know, the launch date was April 18th. As we headed into April, things started to get a little crazy. So um, the core partners on this event sat down and had a, had a Zoom call and we, we had two options. We could either abandon ship, which would have been perfectly you know, reasonable mm -hmm. given all of our ev events were basically in-person events or just think creatively about how we could pivot and either offer events virtually or provide people with things that they could do at home. And um, in particular, the idea of providing uh, students and kids with things to do at home was really appealing because we all know that those first couple of weeks transitioning to homeschooling was a real, you know, it was a real uh, learning curve for everybody, including <laughs> the teachers. And so the idea of being able to support families and support teachers through some at-home activities, I think, appealed to a lot of the partners. So that was what we did. And two really key things that came out of that. One, and this is something that I talk a lot about in, and we'll talk more about it in our talk on Thursday, but um, in terms of objective settings, these relational objectives like trust are so important when you're thinking about your campaigns and your initiatives. And we had established trust over working together for several months between all of these different organizations. And because we had established this trust, it was very easy for us to pivot. It was very easy for me to get on the phone and call somebody and say, hey, you're doing this art workshop. Can we put an environmental spin on it and pu push it out to students and provide them with something to do? Um, Newport Film was great. They were doing uh, virtual film screenings. And so they came on board and did an environmentally film themed film. Um, and so we ended up having two dozen different activities and events over the course of the week. 600 people participated. We had phenomenal reach on social media and it ended up, I think it ended up working out really well. It was nice because it kind of provided a bit of a distraction when things were really, really um, 
you know, getting pretty intense Bumpy. with COVID. Yeah, exactly. Now, another one of the interesting outcomes was that, you know, we had this, these incredible constraints of, well, we can't bring people together in a particular place, but it also freed us up to look at things differently. So all of a sudden we're not constrained by having an event at a particular time or in a particular place. Right. So we could now all of a sudden reach new audiences. So if we're doing a, a virtual lecture on climate change, now I had friends from Toronto joining in the call for this. And mm -hmm. if we created um, a handout version or a, a PDF of a native species spotting thing, then that could be distributed across the entire school district as opposed to having this workshop in a particular location that only a certain number of people get to go through. As well, um, Clean Ocean Access had a virtual student showcase. And instead of that being you know, a Thursday evening event between this time that maybe only certain people could make it to, now all of a sudden it was there up for the duration of the week for anybody to see. And also for families to share via social media. So it really, you know, while it was a challenge and really difficult, you know, had us hopping around for a while, it really made us view things differently. And, you know, some big lessons learned are that, well, if we do this again next year, we definitely want to have a virtual component so that we're not just right. constrained to those specific location-based events. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think um, there are a lot of, I think there's a lot of really good lemonade coming out of this, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, okay, forcing, forcing change and habits and evaluating is, you know, well, well, maybe painful, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right, to come up with new ways to, to engage people, which is the ultimate goal, right? You can still meet your goals, you just, the delivery method is a little bit different. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'd like to jump into uh, some of the some of the deep dive that we're going to uh, climb into. But what are some of the ways that science communications tries to prevent public confusion? Um, we know that uh, a lot of times marketers do much more or err on the side of failing fast. Um, and I, my, my sense is that science communications takes a little more of a precaution or move forward with caution. Um, and so what are some, some things that may adapt and, and that marketers um, and small businesses and organizations can use from science communications? Okay, so first of all, you mentioned one thing called failing fast, which is a term that's used a lot in marketing and in the innovation sector, which you know, I think is awesome and it definitely has its place. Um, but in terms of science communication, um, it's not always, it's not necessarily the approach that's always taken. I think that's one area where there, where in terms of best practices, it's not really um, the approach taken in science communication. You know, if you're focused on spreading awareness, um, you know, just increasing awareness around a new scientific discovery, for example, that might be a good approach. Um, but if you're wanting to help people understand or feel or behave a certain way, I think strategic approaches are better. Um, ultimately, you don't want to create confusion uh, or ever, you know, by accident, you know, confuse people um, or, you know, cause people to feel the opposite of what you originally attend intended. And, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges I have with failing fast is that it can be misleading and that it doesn't acknowledge the impacts of things like misconceptions or a loss of public trust, which can be extremely difficult to reverse. Um, and I think, you know, for science communication, things like public trust are very important, public trust in scientists and uh, the scientific process. There's a great example in the UK during the 1990s, there was the outbreak of BSC or mad cow disease and public health officials, you know, for years told people that it was safe to eat British beef, which in fact it wasn't and several people died. And it has literally taken the UK decades to reestablish public trust because of that. So again, um, I think that I know, in the field of science communication, it's often more strategic approach 
is um, is preferred than the fail fast approach. Now, one of the one of the good outcomes of the situation that happened in the UK is that a result as a result of this, they have developed some of the best strategies and best practices around science communication and public engagement because they had to basically rebuild from the ground up. And um, so that was one thing that I really appreciated from the program at Edinburgh is they had all this amazing insight from that rebuilding process of working with the public to rebuild trust and to communicate and engage people in science and to you know bring them back to the table after such a such a rocky period yeah and still uh still is you know it's being brought up today when they talk mm -hmm. about how they're managing uh covid and communications so so i guess mm -hmm. university of edinburgh is the right place to go get a science communications master's degree i think it is you know because working in north america i had been to all the industry conferences here and seen the same examples and the same the same approaches brought up over and over again and at when i was at university of edinburgh all of a sudden i was getting um examples of initiatives from all over the world all across europe australia um even china and singapore so it was very interesting to see you know, for each culture, different audiences has different approaches to and different issues as well. So, um, you know, different ways of approaching science communication and public engagement. So it was really refreshing to sort of get this much broader perspective Global view. Literally. Yeah, on yeah. the field. But again, the principles are all pretty much the same, I think. Um, but I just think that at the sort of government and institutional level, the field of science communication and public engagement has has advanced a little further than it has here in North America in the UK again for those those mm. reasons that we talked about yeah. previously so really really interesting to see that um, but they all you know again fundamentally no matter you know who's you know anyone looking at best practices in science communication and public engagement will there will still be the same fundamental principles and the tools that apply Nice. Well, one thing um, you mentioned principles. I'm wondering if you can jump into a couple of those. I know uh, we've talked about jargon and uh, using metaphors. Can you mm -hmm. dive into right. this a little bit? Yeah. So, and, you know, again, a lot of the stuff, some of the tools we'll be sharing will be things that people are already using or aware of, but I'm hoping to just sort of put them in a, in a package or in a framework for, for people to apply. But um, you know, the use of jargon and technical terms is a massive barrier in science communication or has been for a long time. So getting, getting scientists to drop those six syllable words and, and speak more colloquially or using everyday language. So, you know, no matter who, no matter, you know, no matter who you are, if you're going to be communicating with the public, you want to make sure that you're speaking to the public in the language that they're familiar with using terms that they're familiar with. Um, we talked about uh, analogies and metaphors, you know, these can help make abstract concepts a little more concrete for people and also give them a sense of how things work. One of my favorite examples of a metaphor, and it's used in climate change, is the idea of, you know, the underlying process of carbon dioxide and the impact on our planet as being a heat trapping blanket. And that's a very simple metaphor, but it helps people understand, again, make this abstract thing of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. It helps people understand the mechanism of, you know, that heat that our planet is radiating, not being able to escape out into space. And then from that metaphor, you can then get into um, some of the impacts on our climate and then some of the solutions and things that we need to do. So um, metaphors and analogies can be really helpful. Um, let me see what else here. I had a list of things um, to talk about. Um, oh, obviously narratives, which is something that you know of well, you know of well, I'm sure, but crafting these, you know, crafting these rich narratives um, can be so effective because the human brain is hardwired for stories. And, you know, if you can craft a rich narrative 
as a, as a vehicle to, to deliver your content, people are going to be much more engaged and they're going to enjoy, enjoy what you have to say so much more. Um, some of my favorite podcasts do an excellent job at uh, delivering really, you know, delivering and discussing, discussing really complex topics, but making it really engaging through narratives. And these are Radio Lab and Story Collider. And Sue, I think you were going to post links to those. Um, but they're great examples of how to translate complex top topics into these rich narratives. Yeah, one other thing uh, I just wanted to mention when we were talking about metaphors, there's, uh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the book Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. And one of the tenets of that is positioning. So if you're introducing something that's new, you have to put it into context of what else is out there. So uh, one of the examples, because the book came out in 1984, is um, I think Hertz versus um, Avis, right? Like how do you, like people know about Hertz, but they don't know about Avis and how do you compare and contrast? And um, it's, it's actually really great to listen to on Audible because they have kind of this old timey, uh, narrator right and then they're talking about these brands like sanka coffee like oh my god my grandmother used to drink sanka coffee <laughs> it's just kind of funny but uh but i think you know those are some great points and i'm putting in a couple um tips in here for radio lab story collider um and i'm just curious because i know that we are planning to wrap up pretty soon but if you could just preview a couple um a couple things that we're going to jump into deeper on the deep dive on June 11th at 7 p.m. that is relatable for businesses or careers or organizations of all sizes because as you're trying to engage with people, with human beings, you know, it could even be your colleagues or your bosses or your spouse. Like, what are some other things that, that you have in store for us? So um, I think the key takeaway is that if you're engaging with the public or these audiences, you really want to be intentional. Um, with some of these initiatives, you're putting so much time and effort and passion into them. And you have this idea at the beginning of what you want to achieve. And so what are some strategies that you can use to make sure you get to that end result that you accomplish what you set out to achieve, or at least you're able to track whether you're um, on track to accomplish your goals or not. And so that's really what strategic science communication and public engagement is about. It's about what are some steps and processes that I can use to help ensure that I'm getting to these outcomes at the end. And it's, you know, again, it comes from the world of science where everybody is obsessed in, in you know, making sure that their results uh, pair up with, you know, their original hypothesis. So, um, you know, there's uh, essentially, I've come up with seven steps. Um, talking about knowing your audience and really identifying them and that's the place that you start in to defining really clear objectives that you can measure and track your progress against and we're going to look at a spectrum of in objectives for engaging with the public from your traditional communication objectives like increasing awareness and understanding to way down to the other end of the spectrum the more relational or behavioral objectives where you're trying to say, um, lower perceptions of risk um, when people are coming into your place of business or help them to feel safe or that you want people to feel like they can trust you or you want to make sure that people can trust you. So how do you, how do you tackle objectives like that? And what are some objectives? What are some ways that you can measure that? And what are some of the different mechanisms you can, you can run um, in order to uh, try and achieve those objectives. So we're going to talk about just that whole spectrum of objectives with some examples of some different tactics that you can use to achieve them. And then at the end, we'll talk about, well, at the end, how do you evaluate against that to see how you did? And then wrapping it all up with this um, overview of the reflective practice. And that's really what it comes down to. You don't have to have, you know, a, a huge budget for evaluation. It really just comes down to a way of working, of being reflective, of being intentional, of starting upfront with being clear about who your audience is, knowing them, and then what is it that you hope to do, 
and thinking about ways that you can track your progress. And that's all that it comes down to. And while it might seem like a little bit more work up front, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're able to say, well, hey, we actually accomplished this and establish benchmarks for future initiatives or report back on how you actually did or in fact learn something that you can apply you know, the next time around, then that little bit of extra work, that, that time it took for you to kind of shift the approach that you take in your work makes it all worth it at the end of the day. Yeah, I think so. And um, I think Avi makes a really good point. Uh, Avi, you want to jump on? Yeah, um, just back to what Sarah was talking about a few minutes ago, uh, makes me think about a lot of um, academic, academic and science presentations I've um, been, you know, been at when they're not necessarily meant to be the peer-reviewed version, right? It's the one-hour um, version of that and still those people might spend half an hour on their methodology and that gets so deep and so complicated that i i lose focus or i i'm i'm lost by the time they get to what they're actually trying to talk about and what the point they're actually trying to make so um i i just see how it's it's applicable in many ways yeah you know avi i'm glad you mentioned that because um just over the years and having worked with a lot of scientists and it, you know and it, you know i'm even guilty of this myself sometimes is you're so deep into what you're doing and what you're interested in and you forget the whole point of communicating is is not just to you know get what you think is interesting out there but to to help people see how it relates to them in their lives and so that's why in the seven step, the number, the first step is always thinking about who is your audience and what are their needs, what are their interests, so that you can connect with them and make what you do relevant to them, so that there's points of entries for them into what you're actually having to say. Um, and without that, they just tune out. And you know, we're bombarded now more than ever with information. So unless you can connect with your audience up front, you're doesn't matter what you want to do, you're not going to get anywhere because they're just not going to hear what you have to say. Yeah, and you know, if they've already been able to uh, publish that research, I trust that the methodologies they used were legitimate. So. <laughs> Great point. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just by nature of having a platform uh, that's respected, right? That you don't have to necessarily dive into all the diagnostics, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. Cool, all right. So do we have other, other questions or comments? We wanna open that up and see what everybody is thinking. And anyone? Um, yeah, and I think Sarah too, you know, if you could just mention, I know that you're starting to do some work with small businesses because uh, trying to, as we are reopening here in Rhode Island, what what are maybe some of the challenges that you're seeing or some tips for small businesses or organizations that are welcoming the public or would like to welcome the public again? Yeah, um, one of the really interesting things is that with the coronavirus, we've all sort of had to become science communicators um, because it's, it's affecting every single aspect of our lives. And so, um, some of this, you know, and, and the science communication tactics here definitely apply. One thing with coronavirus, you definitely want to be upfront about the uncertainty. These are extremely uncertain times. And so as a, if you have a business, I mean, you, you don't want to seem to come across as if you've got it all under control. Um, you can be honest about the uncertainty and that, you know, things are changing. I think most people understand that, but I think it's important to remember. Um, also be inclusive with your language. You know, I've seen a lot of language like, um, the vulnerable or the at risk or the elderly, but nobody likes to think of themselves as elderly. So, you know, people or, or vulnerable, for example. So messages like that can be dismissed easily by people. So I think you have to be careful. Try to be a little bit more specific about those groups that you're talking about with. And I talked about that um, sort of spectrum of engagement objectives. Um, with COVID right now, because emotion is such a big part of it, you really want to focus your initiatives and your communication objectives around relational objectives or 
behavioral objectives, relational in particular, like feelings of trust, um, perceptions of risk. You really want to help people. If let's say you have a, a, a physical space where people are coming into, you want to ensure that people feel safe there. So how do you how do you set objectives around helping people feel safe and then track against them? Because if you're not doing that, if you're not focused on helping people feel safe and lowering perceptions of risk, you're going to have a very difficult time reopening in this new environment. And so um, what I'm really trying to help people to do is just focus on those two or three very simple relational objectives. You know, you, it, you can't accomplish these things with something on your website and a couple of social media posts. If you want to affect or influence how people feel or building, you know, trust, that has to happen through much deeper level of engagement. And it you probably need to approach it a few different ways. And so being really intentional about your communication strategy um, right now is more important than ever. And uh, yeah, once again, I, I feel almost clairvoyant that we had planned this in January. <laughs> Like, oh, I mean, we talked about it for a while, but then it was like, oh, yeah, let's, let's pull this together. Let's see if we can do it. And, uh, you know, we could talk about Aquinic Island Earth Week and now just boom, science communication is huge. Mm -hmm. We could spend a whole hour asking you questions about the state's communication strategy, the country's communication strategy all around COVID, reopening. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very interesting time right now, isn't it? Because... So many people, um, they've lost so much trust mm -hmm. uh, from all different levels of socioeconomic, all different kinds of um, pers different perspectives I'm starting to feel, right? To hear. Mm -hmm. it's, right now, they really could use um, an updated communication strategy. Yeah. And, you know, again, those, that relationship stuff, like, feelings of benevolence or trust that happens at a really deep level uh, in our brain of cognitive processing. And again, this just this short spurts of information, which most of our communication is designed for will not impact people on that deeper, deeper level. And so it's going to take, it's going to take some real work, much like in the UK that we saw back in the nineties in in rebuilding public trust in in all of these different organizations that were that were involved in in that um, in that that huge catastrophe. So I think that you know, and like you said, we're seeing it across the board right now. So I think a more thoughtful, a more strategic, a more focused approach to the way that we communicate and engage with people is going to be. I hope is going to be the new norm. I mean, certainly, I think that. If you want to succeed today in this environment, you're, you're going to be a lot more effective if you can think that way. Yeah, one thing I wanted to just go back to was the vulnerable populations. I think raise your hand if you know someone who is in a vulnerable, is vulnerable, but does not recognize that. As I, as I like to say, um, the greater the risk, the, le the less concern. It seems to be such a particular habit. I mean, you know, my mom's 79 and she's in great health. So she doesn't see herself as a 79 year old. And yeah, it's just, it's challenging. I think, you know, when- My dad I, too, yeah. same thing. Another example is the whole debate about masks, right? If they had come out with the phrase face covering to begin with, it would have eliminated this whole, I think N95, you know, venting mask, non-venting mask, just cover your damn face, please. You mm -hmm. know, keep your sneezes to yourself. Um, mm -hmm. That would have and, gone a long way. Yeah, and Sue, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but when you, you know, early on, we weren't talking about how, and I get, obviously we're, we've learned as we've gone with this because sure. it is a new, a new virus. But, um, you know, now when we talk about wearing masks, now we talk about how the virus spreads and through droplets um, infecting your respiratory system. So now you need to unpack that. You can't just tell people you must wear a face covering, but if you back it up with, you know, 
to prevent the transmission of droplets or, or the transmission of the, the virus through the droplets, then people can understand the mechanics behind it and it makes sense. It sticks in their brain. Whereas if they're just told to do something, that's very easy for them to let go of. Right. Um, so yeah, some of those approaches, and we're seeing that more now, thankfully, in a lot of the communication. So since we uh, jumped on the, the issue of uh, the topic of masks, we have a client who um, they make a health, it, they're focused on health IT, but the CEO was the former chief medical officer for Verizon. And he had a very strong opinion as it relates to masks and the importance for wearing them. So early on, he put together a rather extensive white paper that really laid out the importance of and why everybody should wear a mask. And he took a, also an approach that was counter to, to, to the message that was being broadly broadcasted, which was you wear a mask to protect others mm -hmm. because he knew that that doesn't resonate with certain people that are more focused on themselves. Right. It's, it's natural as human beings to also have that perspective. And he laid it on a very logical manner. The, the white paper, I think, got a, a million or so downloads. Before you knew it, he was on C, uh, MSNBC and covered extensively. And again, it was a very you know thoughtful, practical explanation as to why it is important to wear masks. What is so simple, you still need to lay out with an authoritative voice. Um, so yeah, can't, can't say enough about the importance of really making a strong case for something in, in simple language. And don't assume people are gonna uh, just understand all the subtleties, you've really gotta lay it out there. Um, one of the resources that I'll share next Thursday is an excellent um, set of articles and tools that were put forward by the Frameworks Institute. And they do research on framing, which particular frames people respond to and types of language and such. And they've done a whole series on how to communicate with, a, with the public around COVID. And um, they do talk about that um, appealing to the individual, but also to the masses. And um, they say to appeal to both because for some, some people will resonate to, you know, it's the morally correct thing to do is to, to look after others, whereas others will, will, um, will respond to the individual. But they've got some terrific resources in there. And I would definitely suggest that everybody check that out. Again, whether you're a small business, a nonprofit, a government organization, um, there are some excellent tips in there as well. Sue and I were talking about this too. And, you know, um, with COVID and unpacking that why, the same strategy, I was joking, we also used in the Open Space and Fields Committee when we were talking about combating dog waste in Middletown. And, you know, you see signs everywhere asking people to pick up after their pets, but they don't explain why. And so we did something very simple with the signage in our public spaces where we explain that. Um, and we appeal to different values that the Quidnick Islanders identify with. We talked about it degrading the parks. We talked about it transmitting disease and negatively impacting water quality. And those are three things that we know that Quidnick Islanders really care about. But we had to, what we, our approach now is to um, attach that appeal to the reasons why you need to do that so that people can now, you know, it'll stick cognitively and they'll understand why we're asking them to do that. And I would say it was extremely effective because the park that I am often in that's right near Sarah's house was just, I mean, a war zone of dog poop two years ago. It was just ridiculous. You could not walk through without stepping in it. And, um, and it's made a huge difference. There's hardly any now. So the, you know, if you can connect with what those values are and make people realize, oh, there's context to this. So it's not just you, it's not just you're asking a favor. There's a reason behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Any other uh, comments or questions? The one word that um, I know has been even more so in my mind that you've used quite a few times in this past hour is thoughtful. I, I think that um, another silver lining, so is that um, I feel like even those of us who I think tend to be thoughtful already, 
um, are being more mindful of the importance of thoughtfulness in everything we do. So thank you, Sarah and Suzanne. This was a great conversation.